They are a surgical description for a remedy to habits that we'd like to change. Okay, I need you to hear this. He uses very specific words, and it's, it, this is about habits. This is about behaviors that we would like to change. And his prescription or his treatment for us insists that anything which causes us to sin should be completely cut out of life. Completely cut out of life. Now, if you go and, and uh, somebody has their hand cut off, does their hand grow back? No. Now, if it was an accident, they can put it back on, which is a miracle, is it not? I mean, that's pretty miraculous. Okay? But what Jesus is talking about is get rid of something and don't take it back. You don't chase the garbage truck down and ask for your garbage back. You shouldn't do the same with these things that, you, that we need to get rid of. When I was a little child, um, I would go over to Grandma Yurida's house. And uh, my grandparents, uh, Grandpa and Grandma Yurida, were both school teachers. And when I was a little boy, I'd go over to Grandma's house. Grandma taught me how to make pot holders. Y'all remember those? Oh, that was, mmm. I'm still in therapy. All right? <laughs> my grandmother, we would make our own Christmas ornaments. And, and she would take prescription bottles that were clear. They weren't brown back in the 1960s. And, and they were clear. And we would put um, molding clay in the lid. And then we'd put these little animals or little Christmas trees. And then we'd screw it on and we'd have a little hanger. And so I made my own Christmas ornaments as a child. And I learned later it's because my grandparents were incredibly cheap. <laughs> but I would, my, my grandparents, we didn't get to do fun things. My grandparents ran flashcards at me all the time. You know, pluses and minuses and timeses and gazintas. You know the gazintas? Three gazintas, 27, nine times. Okay, gazintas. Okay? And we would do this on hours on end. And when I went to kindergarten, I could do all four kinds of math, read and write cursive. I went the first day, they handed out this piece of paper for parents to fill out, I turned it in. The lady goes, who did that? And I said, I did. She handed me another one, she goes, no you didn't, and made me do it again. I went to first grade the next day, because I could already read and write. The problem was, my grandmother was extremely strict, and you did not step out of line. And one of my grandmother's favorite words to me was, Tommy, you need to cut that out. And that's where the topic and the title comes from today, in honor of my grandmother. Jesus' words to us, you really need to cut that out. Let's pray with her. God, we just asked today that in the next few minutes, that as we're talking and as we're thinking and as we're listening, that you would speak very loud to us and that the things that you're asking us to do and the things that you're asking us to be would make sense to us and that somehow in all of this, that we, we have it applied to our daily lives, whether that be at work or whether it be at home, that somehow the things that you're, you're implying or imploring us to do is that we seriously consider them. In Christ's name, amen. Our habits enslave us. Would you agree? And as people, and particularly as North Americans, we find ourselves stuck. And we've tried everything we can think of to get away from it. But the answer is pretty simple. Cut it out. That's what Jesus says. And I'm going to put the handcuffs on just to show you, demonstrate to you, because I talk with my hands, how hard this will be for me to do something as simple <coughs> Let's turn the page. I'm really interested to see how I'm going to play the end. Now I want you to listen. Throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is talking to us about real life situations. He's not making things up. This isn't a fantasy. This isn't Disney World. He's not making up a comic book. These are real things throughout the whole thing. Do you agree? He goes on to tell us and consistently telling us that what we think, how we think, determines what we believe. And what we believe determines how we act. And nowhere in this section of the teaching is that more applicable than here. This is what you think, how you think will determine what you believe. And what you believe will determine how you act. It does not matter the subject. There are people today who think we're in a recession. Because they've been told it a million times. It's not true by fact. But it's true because they believe it. Well, listen, I believed in a dude in a red suit with flying deer coming down my chimney for a long time, but that didn't make it true. How we think, what we think about, will determine what we believe. And what we believe will be shown to the world by how we act. In order to change our actions, you have to change how you think. Those of you that have ever been on a diet, those of you that have ever tried to train yourself for, for a marathon or for some kind of thing, you have to change the way that you think about food. You can't love cheeseburgers anymore. Cheeseburgers are your enemy. 
You can't like bread. You can't like sugar. You can't like salt because those things are your enemy. You got to change how you think about food if you're going to lose weight, and if you're going to, and then you got to change your mind about exercise. Exercise has to become something you want to do. You have to change how we think, and as a church, this applies to us too. If we want to be a growing church, we got to change the way we think. We got to think like a growing church. Would you agree? So what that means is if we want to be a church of 150, then we believe that this is all the people that God has asked us to reach in Orlando, then we can keep thinking like we're thinking, because that's where we are. But if we believe God's got more people for us to reach out to, then we need to think like a church of 250 or a church of 400, because churches of 400 think differently than churches of 150. And churches of 150 think different than churches of 50. And so if we really believe that we're done, then we don't have to change. But if we believe we're on the edge of something then we have to continually revamp the way we think, even as a church family. What's, what's the definition of insanity? Do the same old thing and expect different results? <laughs> hey, what happened? We use the phrase a lot in the church, stumbling block. Well, I don't want to be a stumbling block. I don't want to be a... What is a stumbling block? Well, here's what it is. It actually comes from a Greek word. The root of it is a word called scandalon, which in the modern-day English language, we get the word scandal. Kind of like John Edwards. He's in a scandal right now. True, not true, we don't know yet. But he's in a scandal. But the word is also connected to a Greek word, which is scandalathron. And scandalathron is translated as a bait stick in a trap. In other words, it's the, it's the bait inside uh, the bear trap. Think of it that way. It's a word which came to mean anything which would cause a person's destruction. Anything. So anything that, that lures you away. And culturally, in the Jewish culture, there were two pictures, two things that, that uh, this word was used to describe. And both of them are intentional. One of them was a hidden stone that was placed in a path so, or, or a cord, a string, so that people would deliberately trip. And it was placed there by thieves so that people would be walking along, trip and fall, the thieves would jump them, mug them, take their stuff, and then the people would, would leave. That, so it was put there on purpose. Think of it like one of the parking blocks put in the way, and you didn't know it was there. The second description was a pit or a hole that was dug in the middle of a path, and it was covered over with leaves or brush, and then as people would be headed down the, the, the path, they would fall into the pit, but they couldn't get away. Okay, this was for slow thieves. Okay, they couldn't chase you. All right? But the point was is that both of them were intentional, but the results were different. One, eventually you could get away from, but the pit you might not even get out of. And so when you read the story uh, of, of the Good Samaritan, and the, the, it says the man is headed down the path, and, and he comes upon some thieves. It's kind of this, this scenario. These guys were waiting for them, for him. Okay? So it means two things, a pit or, or just a, a trip up. But both of them were intentional. The scandal on...